Good evening, Lamoille County. We are so excited to have you for our, our, Mar our May uh, meeting of Lamoille Democrats. I'm Scott Weathers, the chair of Lamoille Dems. Um, and we're really excited to be talking this month about racial justice issues. Um, obviously, we saw the Derek Chauvin verdict uh, earlier last month, and um, so we're really excited to be joined this month by uh, two excellent leaders in our community. Uh, they're doing amazing work, both at the statewide level and at the county level on racial justice issues. Um, so I'll introduce them. I'm, we're really, really glad and excited to be, uh, to be featuring Maroney Minter, who's the campaign director of the ACLU of Vermont, um, as well as Saudia Lamont, uh, who is the steering committee chair of REAL, which is the Racial Equity Alliance of Lamoille. Um, so I'm really excited to have both of them speaking today to give us a, uh, an inside view of the work that's happening both at the state level and, and the county level in Lamoille on racial justice issues. Um, so I'll open it up to Maroney. Uh, if you wanna tell us a little bit about the work you're doing, we would love to hear from you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for Having me join you tonight, it's really nice to see so many faces um, that I know. Um, and uh, as Scott already said, my name is Maroney. I'm the campaign director with uh, the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, I'm also serving on the governor's task force. Uh, and I'm also the co-founder of the Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Coalition. Uh, but tonight I'm here to speak about some of the work that we are doing at the ACLU related to racial justice. Uh, we've been working on a lot of um, different issues from racial justice, police reform, criminal law reform, voting rights, immigration rights and reproductive freedom and so on. Um, we, we have been moving forward a wide range of policy priorities um, at the municipal, state and federal level. Our policy advocacy continues to, to, uh, to be broad with a particular focus on creating a smart criminal legal system and, and reducing the footprint of law enforcement um, throughout the state, and while also addressing um, systemic racism. So, as I mentioned, um, I continue to serve on the, uh, as the ACLU representative on the governor's um, racial equity task force. Uh, in recent year, the, the task force has made um, two rounds of recommendation to promote racial equity as a state. Uh, we have also, um, we're now planning to turn our focus on, on policing, starting uh, with our the ACLU's 10-point plan that we put out last year uh, to reimagine uh, public safety. Uh, in addition to that, we have been pushing on some bills, um, and those will include uh, H-145. This is a bill that would make minor clarifications to the, the use of force statute passed by the legislature last year. Um, we've invested significant um, time engaging in testimony on issues to ensure that any amendments to the law do not weaken our use of force restrictions. Um, after tracking the, this bill through the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, we're happy to say that uh, we did not object to the bill as it, as it was passed. So the bill is now heading to the governor's uh, desk for approval, which is very exciting. Uh, there is also S18, uh, earned time. We've had to spend a lot of time engaging with the Senate Judiciary and the House Corrections and Institution Committee uh, opposing S18, which is a bill that would disqualify people convicted of certain offense from earning time off their sentence. Um, so after you know, multiple rounds of testimony, the Senate and the House moved forward with the bill over our objections. So our advocacy helped push the committee to really limit the scope of the bill by removing uh, disqualifying crimes and ensuring that this bill was not um, you know, to be to apply to people who have yet to be sentenced. Uh, and then there is uh, S45. Uh, this is a bill that would strengthen uh, the existing midpoint review process and probations. And it would also increase the likelihood that people um, who have met their requirements could have their parole terminated after a midpoint. Um, this bill came out 
out of the Justice Reinvestment Working Group that we participated in um, during last fall. Um, there are other bills that will likely pass. Uh, one of them is one, uh, H196. And this, you know, one of our, our racial justice priorities uh, we've identified to the legislature is to pro uh, provide adequate funding uh, and staffing to the Office of uh, Executive Director of Racial Equity. Um, so this bill, uh, H196, we increase staffing for the office and providing uh, Executive Director um, Susanna Davis with more support. Uh, and there's also H317. Uh, this is a bill, uh, again, one of our top priorities this session is to get better data that, that can help us better understand and address the racial disparities in the criminal legal system. So um, this, you know, this bill is newly introduced um, and it will include the recommendation of the racial disparity advisory panel. Uh, the bill only started receiving hearings after crossover deadline and has generated a lot of debate uh, about the new uh, bureau and, and where it could be housed. So uh, we're hoping that that will pass. And if not, we'll continue to push on that. There's also H87. Uh, and H87 would create a uniform structure for property crimes. Uh, it would reduce maximum penalties on a significant number of crimes and raise Vermont felony thresholds from uh, 900 to 3,000. So this is really exciting because if passed, this bill will give Vermont the highest felony threshold in the country and expand uh, the number of people eligible for expungement. Uh, and then finally, S63, um, this is a bill that would ban school districts from hiring and retaining school resource officers, which is a fancy word, word for police in school. So the bill received uh, a lot of attention when first introduced and we generated dozens of messages to senators um, and, and support the Senate Education Committee has yet to, to take on the bill. Um, at this point, we, we don't think um, the bill will, will pass, but we'll continue to push on it on uh, you know, next session because this is one of our priorities as well. So that's how I have five to 10 minutes. Um, that's kind of, you know, some of the few, few of the many bills that we have been working on. I'm happy to answer questions if folks have any. Great. Thank you, Maroney. That, those are really fascinating bills, really important legislation, and I, I appreciate you walking us through all of those. Um, I'd love to, if it's okay, just take questions at, at the end um, and just give Saudi a time right now to tell us a little bit about the work that she's doing uh, as steering committee chair at, at the Racial Equity Alliance of Lamoille. So, Saudi, please take it away. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. So, my name is Saudia, and I am the chair, so to speak, uh, I prefer the term visionary director <laughs> at REAL, the Racial Equity Alliance of Lamoille. Um, REAL is a community coalition open to all who are invested in building a safe, equitable, anti-racist community where all can thrive regardless of the color of their skin, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, gender, or any other aspect of identity. REAL is led by a steering committee the steering committee is a group of committed people volunteering our time and energy on difficult and entrenched topics, working to make positive change in our community. We've worked for over three years now to get the alliance to this point, the point of holding consistent monthly meetings. We have community conversations on the second Wednesday of every month at 530. We have six working subgroups, communication and action, civics and public safety, real schools, business, and our new health and human services, another new, the, the new two newest health and human services and development and funding um, are our two newest subcommittees. Each of these committees meet outside of the alliance every month, and then we come back together to update at the community conversations about the work that they've been doing. Real schools, we also have youth coalition um, with youth ambassadors. We have we're working on building our ally network. 
we've been doing community reads, we've had protests, rallies, drives. We have a BIPOC affinity space, um, which I also facilitate. And, um, and we're working on so many more things. Right now, there's um, lots of things happening in real schools with equity policies in the schools. And um, a lot of school um, districts are requesting funding for racial equity work. And so we're kind of informing that work. There's also community work coming up um, with everything that's happening in the world. It's an ongoing battle just to really not only address, but identify and understand and really look at the impacts of systemic racism as they apply to us in real time. Um, and then there's community events coming up with Juneteenth coming up. So please check out our website if anyone has any questions. Um, you can email us at info at reallamoyobt.org. Our vision statement is we envision a community that embodies inclusion, equity, and justice as values central to our identity. We are committed to building a safe community where all people experience dignity and respect and all are welcome with kindness and belonging. There's been so much happening in the world, not only in the world, but in our community. What people don't seem to realize is that we exist here in Lamoille County. We may be few, but we are here. And so what the work, part of the work that we are doing is to really build a sense of community amongst, amongst BIPOC um, Lamoille County community members. And not only build a sense of community amongst us, but then the counterpart of our allies, systems of safety and networks for safety and protection of our BIPOC community members. Safety is a real issue here in our in Lamoille County. Uh, someone, something, you know, it's people are like, oh my goodness. But you know, and then it's hard because you don't want to perpetuate the cycles of, you know, the trauma parade where it's only just sharing the trauma, the trauma, the trauma. There's so many dynamics to this, and there's so many different aspects that we really have to look at. And, and ultimately, it's that BIPOC people are here. <laughs> and we are, some of us are well, some of us not so much. Some of us have access to resources and things. Some of us not so much, right? And learning, understanding, learning new knowledge for everyone, getting that shared language and doing the work to come together and make, make our community better. That looks to different missions, which are diverse, not so much. They are definitely white dominated spaces, unfortunately. So if there are any BIPOC Memorial County members, Please join sitting on a real meeting. Any one of our sub, your presence is welcome and needed and encouraged, as well as our BIPOC community space. So the two spaces we hold look very different. Here we hold for a conversation is where we're ready to level up and take action and really focus on building those structures and systems so that we have the same levels and sense of systems of care as our white counterparts, yes? And then the counter here is our BIPOC, a sense of community and coming together and understanding each other and our experiences. We're a multi-generational group. So we have youth, we have adults, we have community members, we, um, folks that are just in our BIPOC affinity space. It's a very beautiful multi-generational multi and multicultural group. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful. So yeah, we are here and come and, and converse and commune with us, be in unity in our community and work towards anti-racism and social. Amazing, thank you, Sadia. Um, well, I wanna open it up to questions now. Just to kick it off, I'll, I'll ask one of, of, of y'all, Marini and Sadia. Um, I think, you know, obviously in the last year have 
uh, focused on you know individual action that we can do to uh, to, to to fight back against racism and to to improve the individual actions we can take, but obviously you know engage. And so I'd just love to hear kind of what each of y'all see as some of the, the primary systemic barriers, systemic uh, examples of oppression and racism and, and ways that, um, uh, you know, we're working with it to, uh, to dismantle or, or change and improve. So um, we'd love to hear kind of some of the system, systemic barriers that you see. Um. I think some of the barriers, uh, some of the challenges in doing this work is first of all, you have to accept that there's a problem. Um, and that's that's one of the children when we're trying to pass laws to address uh, policing. This is usually this pushback that why we're doing this when George Floyd got killed in Minneapolis. That does not happen here in Vermont. Refusal to accept that these things do, do happen here in Vermont. And, and when we see the report that like come out, how black and brown people are, you know, pulled over at the higher rate than any other ways here in Vermont. Um, so that's that, you know, Vermont is exceptional. Um, the other thing is, especially for, for me locally, trying to do this work and being one of the only uh, person of color in my homes, uh, you are the problem for now being the one organizing the community to address some of the racial uh, Issue, risk issues in our community. So for me, I'm going who the chair has turned the entire conversation about race. The fact that he suggested that to address uh, police killing of black and brown people, what we need to just in the, so that when calls are made, uh, if someone's name is Mohammed, we the caller, the dispatcher can automatically assume that that person is black, therefore sending a black police officer. Segregation. So having to try to hold them accountable and, and it's become, you know, me versus him thing and, and, and feels like, uh, and, and, and being said that, you know, we never have to talk about these issues 10 years ago. Uh, because we have new people moving into our community. Now we're having to, so you become the problem, right? And so that, that's also another challenge that I personally am facing in my community and, and also statewide. Um, I would, so first, I just wanna echo a couple of things that I heard from Maroni just now. And I just wanna say, so we, uh, the, I don't know that the the killing of um, black and brown people by police officers in Vermont is a thing. I will say that there are black Vermonters that are missing and are not being looked for. That is a problem. I will say that harm is being caused to black and brown students. That is a problem. I will say that discrimination in healthcare and workforce and other places is happening at alarming rates. And that is a problem. So, you know, I, I, we, that exceptionalism that we believe, you know, Vermont is utopia and it's so progressive. We're such a progressive state and we're doing the work, which to some degree, yes. However, um, there's a lot of language being thrown around, right? DEI, diversity and inclusion, equity, right? All this work, all this, all this language being tossed around. But when it comes to the actuality of the work, and the showmanship and the safety of the lives, of the bodies, of the physical existences, that, that reality is not the same. And so the work that we need to do is to create to bridge that gap, yes, and, and to fix that. And so what are the some of the challenges for, for that I'm noticing are lack of people who have privilege and power, the people in power to stand up and make the hard decisions. 
and I know it's hard and I know that there's a lot of pushback and I know people are trying, but we got to do more and we got to try harder because people are missing and that is not okay, right? When people, and, and similarly to, to Maroney's end of, you know, the, the, the officers talking about segregation, who do we call for help? Because when I call the police for help, uh, when I was experiencing not only racism, but a hate crime and my children's lives were threatened, the police told me to do my best to ignore it. Who's looking out for my safety? If someone can threaten to kill my children and the police tell me to ignore it, who's protecting and serving me? That is a problem, right? And so it just means we have more work to do. That's not to talk negatively about the police, right? It's whatever, it was what it was. We just need to do better, right? We're here, we're all here to learn and grow and to improve. The commitment is to getting better. The commitment is to improving systems. The commitment is to being anti-racist. And so it really, I'm calling people to use your power, use your privilege, use your resources and share them and share them widely and, and reach out and, and don't sit in silence. Yes. And we can do more and we can, and together we can do this. It's going to take more than just throwing out, putting up statements. Towns are putting up statements, which is great. Um, some students are, are working on something um, called a, a pledge that they're working on. I think it's beautiful. I love that language. I, this is like the third time this week I've heard the language of a pledge and I love that. And, and so why, why can we not have, have these systems, these institutions, these businesses, organizations, anything that has leadership and power where people have a pledge to be anti-racist and anti-Semitic and anti-sexist, right? And all of these, and all the isms, right? And, and so, so why can't we do that? And then that way we can hold people accountable when they're not. Similarly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play devil's advocate. I'm gonna say, police take a pledge to protect and serve and they still do not do. So not saying it's a bad thing, just saying there's work to do. Yes? All right. Wow, well, thanks, Sadia, and thanks, Maroney. Um, any other questions uh, about racial justice that folks would want to ask? Yeah, Bruce. Well, I was going to ask, you know, I, I always think about this term systemic racism and, and just what that means and how it impacts people's lives. And I think you gave one example about how the police ignore, you know, your concerns about your own personal safety and those of your children. Um, is, can you give us another example, particularly in Lamoille County, about how um, we we have this issue of systemic racism and, and you know what, that it needs to be addressed and how we might address it? Can you synthesize that a little bit more for me? I guess I think, you know, about, when I think about systemic racism, I think it's we're talking about the systems that kind of maintain a status quo and which are often, you know, have a lot of racist components to them. And so we think about how is it that we identify those systems and then think about the actions that we need to take to change those systems so we alleviate the issue of systemic racism. Ah, there we go. Thank you. So when we're talking about systemic racism, let's look at the systems. Look at how they were founded, when they were founded. We are functioning in antiquated systems that people say the system is failing. The system is not failing. The system is working exactly the way it was intended to, right? And so when we look at the systems in which we're functioning under, our laws, our legislature, look at they're still trying to take a slavery out of, you know, out of certain amendments. These things are there, they're there. The policies are there. It's written, right? And so that the systems, education, how many. We, we, we've had false education for how many years, right? We've ha we're now going backpedaling to try to promote advocating for accurate education, right? For, for, for our communities to, to, um, uh, to change the, the, racist, the, the, the racist themes that have been promoted. So the, the systems, it's everywhere. 
And that's why it's so it's that's why we have so many subgroups, <laughs> right? We have we have so many subgroups. <laughs> this, is big. this is big. And I tell people all the time, you know, I'm like, I know you're overwhelmed. I, I'm telling you, I was up till three o'clock this morning and I woke been up at six. This doesn't stop for me, right? And so, but I tell you, you're overwhelmed because we're we're literally working to change the world right now. We're not the first groups to do this. But hopefully we'll be the last. It's 2021. We should not still be having these conversations, but we are. And it's because it's literally ingrained in the school system, the health system, the public safety system. Our law enforcement focuses on law and enforcing laws. Police were created to catch runaway slaves. We don't look at the systems of how these things were created and how they're carrying into our present time. So when we do that and we go back and we acknowledge the little formula, right? The formula for, for abolishing racism. We're abolitionists over here, right? We're not segregationists. We're not assimilationists. We're abolitionists, yes? And so we acknowledge the past. We have to look at the systems and say, oh, this all men were created equal. All men were not included. Women were not included, right? So we have to look at the, the basic foundations of our systems and really look at how they were created and rewrite them. You know, the pen is mightier than the sword. These things were written into existence. So I'm not a politician. I did run for, I did run for office. I was close, but I didn't make it. I'll be running again. But my, my thing here is, this is the work. It was written into existence. How do you use your political power to rewrite it? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Sadia. Any other questions for Sadia or Maroney? Marina, get her hand up. Oh, thank you, Maroney. Sorry, Marina, yeah, please. Uh, it's more of a comment or an observation than a question. Um, first of all, my, my hat's off to you for this work that you're doing. And um, I must profess that I was, I've been so ignorant and I feel I've learned a lot this year, but I think I think you're right on target and particularly with the schools, we need to we need to learn the facts. I had no idea of the Tulsa massacre. It was not, I grew up in Europe, so we didn't read that much American history, but still. Um, and, and I think, I, I think for the, for the most part, at least that's my choice to think this way, that people wanna understand and know, but first they have to find out. Um, and the work that Real's doing is wonderful. I've always been a fan of ACLU. Um, and, you know, I, I still feel a little bit, what can I do as a privileged white person, the first, thing I'm kind of focusing on is trying not to do any damage, um, any further damage, I should say. Um, I'm well aware of my privilege and, um, you know, I am politically active. <laughs> there are a lot of issues, um, even, you know, beyond racial equality issues. Um, it, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. I'm, I'm Sure you do, Sadia. And you didn't even get in. I did vote for you. <laughs> but um, if you have any sort of um, advice for, you know, how can how can we how can I as a as a, a white privileged person in Stowe make a difference? Oh well. First and foremost, speak up, right? You're doing it. Here's the thing, right? There's, I didn't even finish my three parts. So it was acknowledge the past, work to rewrite. So acknowledge the past, honor the present. 
we have to honor like this is the real lived experience and then build towards a better future. So that was the the cliff notes were rewrite history, but that's the three part <laughs> right formula. So acknowledge the past, honor the present, build towards a better future. And so how can you help? Show up, reach out, engage, engage with real, engage with your local business, have these conversations, learn and, and check yourself, check your bias. We all have bias. I have bias, right? Understand that we all have bias and privilege. And how can we use that to benefit others? Do no harm, right? Do no harm, have a commitment to getting better. Silence is violence. If you see something, say something, right? Don't be a bystander. Because I will tell you, oftentimes when things have happened, the fact that no one around me spoke up was often more painful than the actual racist act that I was experiencing at the time right? Donate your time, donate your energy, donate your money, invest into mutual funds, mutual aids, invest in real, invest in BIPOC organizations and community work, right? This is how we do it. Help create systems, volunteer your time, whatever, whatever you're good at, what is your skill set? This is what I can offer. How can I, how can you use this to help this movement? We're working towards the liberation of Black people and the liberation of BIPOC folks, right? Black, Indigenous, Latina, people of color, Asian Americans, Asian people, Pacific Islanders, Desi Americans. We are people of the global majority and we are here. And so just be an ally, reach out and engage and treat us like humans. You know how many times I hear, I don't know how, to, I've, I've heard, I've never spoken to a BIPOC person when someone was speaking directly to me. I've heard, I don't know how to talk to BIPOC people. And I'm like, they're people. Engage. If there is a language barrier, okay, we can figure out translation, right? But they're humans. And we treat people like humans. Can we acknowledge and honor that we are humans together and find and see the humanity in each other, right? So is that a good start? How did I answer your question, Mariana? Did I give you some starting points? Yes, yes, absolutely. And you know, I, 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 you know, when you say we are human, it's like you should not have to point that out. You know? Yeah, here um, we are. <laughs> it's it's um, yeah. yeah thank you. No, thank you, Mar Maroni. Did you want to add anything on what can people do? What are your suggestions for people who want to get involved and engage? Um, <clears throat> I would say uh, I see Lynn just popped in the chat, kind of exactly what I was going to say. And you already alluded to some of it, but in addition to some of the bills that I went, uh, I I, I uh, talked about. Um, um, Jane shared the document with all the bills, so. I would add a contact to your legislators in terms of all these policies that we're trying to pass. Um, they need to hear from their constituents. I see Representative Yakovonian here and, and uh, noise. Uh, um, so contact them and, and really get engaged and join all of these local groups and uh, contribute when you can, uh, but really volunteer your time and be, be an ally. Uh, you know, there's only a few of us, so we need we need allies. So that's that's what I would add. Great. Well, thank you, Maroni, and thank you, Saudi. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, we do have several legislators here. But I, uh, Amy, did you have one last question by chance? Yes, I, it's not Great. a question. I just wanted to add to that. Oh, I just yeah. wanted to add. Talk to your kids. Talk to your kids as you're learning and you're growing and you're, you know, creating this experience for yourself and, and all this great stuff. Share that with your kids. Have the conversations with your kids because they're the next generation and they need to also understand that it's okay to look different. It's okay to be curious. It's okay. But there's an understanding that needs to be had there. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Can, can, I, can I piggyback off that real quick. Do I have a moment? Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Amy. Thank you. Because you know what? That's been a big conversation at hand. 
especially with a lot of the school districts applying for racial equity things. And like I said, a lot of the towns are putting out their equity statements. Sh shift that language to pledges, right? To hold people accountable for one. And for two, the teaching of the children. I was just on a call previously right before this, and we were having this conversation about the, the conflict or the, the disconnect or the challenge that some people experience with teaching children accurate history or teaching children about anti-Semitism or anti-racism. You know, the, the response was that in that specific space was, we don't talk about religion at school instead of explaining why the language was unacceptable and harmful to the other students. And so I say to you this, when, when, and similarly to what Amy was just saying, yes, teacher children do no harm. Any harmful language is unacceptable, whether it is racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, anything. Any harmful, harm to others is not acceptable. So when we teach each other to be good people and make good choices and exposure, how many times have you seen children who have never seen an amputee before or a person in a wheelchair? They respond with that curiosity and most parents, they're their initial response is to grab the kid. Don't say that, don't look, don't stare, right? No, have the conversations. If we shut down and we don't talk, they'll never learn. And then they'll, they'll fear, right? They'll fear. And that's where the fear breeds. And fear is, that's what's causing all of this, fear of the other. There are no other, we are one, right? And the sooner we all realize that, the better off we'll be. Have those conversations with your children, have those conversations with your grandchildren and your peers and your nieces and your nephews. Yes, colleagues. Thank you, Amy. All right, thank you, Saudi. I really appreciate you sharing that. And thanks, Amy, for, for that comment as well. Um, well, it, it, great time, great transition. You know, we've got uh, some, we've got several legislators, we've got four in the room. Um, so would love to turn it over to them to give uh, their legislative updates. Um, if you'd like to, to touch on uh, racial justice issues, feel free. And um, Lynn and Jen have shared some really excellent resources in the chat. So encourage everybody to check those out. Um, Saudi and Murni, you're totally welcome to stay. We'd love to have you, but no pressure. Uh, either way, um, we're really, really grateful for all your remarks. Um, so I will send it over uh, first to to Dan. I believe you're first alphabetically by last name, if that's okay. So, um, sure. so if you want to kick it off, thank you. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, been definitely a lot going on in on the floor, and also in my committee, we uh, we passed the bill to uh, ban PFOA. Uh, today out of that actually passed the uh, second reading on the floor today. Uh, Dean Whitman, who's in our committee, just did an amazing job presenting the bill. He's, he's, uh, he's a really good guy. Um, so looking forward to seeing that move. Um, it's a Senate bill, so uh, should go on to the governor. Hopefully he'll sign it. It's, we did a lot of work on it. Um, also, um, Last week, the Office of the Child Advocate, a bill I've been working on for quite a while, passed, uh, passed the House, which was great to hear. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to move in the Senate uh, until next year, which is kind of a bummer. It was on the, on the list, but uh, it didn't quite make it. So uh, hoping to see some action on that in the Senate next year. I think that's an important bill that will really help a lot of youth in state custody and, and um, yeah. Uh, you know, if our goal is to make sure that um, youth transition successfully to adulthood, that's, I think this is going to be really helpful to guide the legislature on our policies and, and, um, and making sure that these, um, that our system is working correctly. So um, hoping those two pass out. Sorry, I'm a little scattered. I've been sitting here since eight o'clock this morning. I am, I've had it. <laughs> it's been a long day. I think I can probably speak for a couple others that are here with me who have probably been sitting in front of their computers since eight o'clock. So anyways, but uh, should be done on the 22nd is kind of the, the wrap up date is what we're hearing. So, um, you know, looking forward to that as well. Thanks. Glad to answer any questions about the advocate bill probably can answer them a lot better at this point than trying to give an overview of it, but glad to, uh, glad to answer.
Well, yeah, Dan, we're really grateful to you for joining us and to all our legislators. Thank you. We know you have very long days during the session. So um, any questions for, for Dan? All right. Well, I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna make an executive decision. Uh, Lucy, if you'd like to go next, I know you have to run, so feel free to give your update next if you'd like. Um, thanks. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to head out a little early today, but um, I've been working most recently on on three different policy areas, and two of them intersect pretty closely with racial justice work. So are kind of particularly theme to tonight's meeting. But the first is pupil weights. And so this is when we are counting, when we're um, distributing taxing capacity for different districts and looking at how many students attend school in that district, but also how we weight different students differently who have different needs. Um, the, the kind of empirical evidence we have shows that we're drastically underweighting the additional cost of providing the same education to students in poverty, students who are English language learners, and students um, with geographical sparsity, which basically means rural students or students who, you know, attend small schools because of living in a low population density area. And so the, the, the challenge now is to get that implemented. We understand that we're miscounting students in a way that is harmful to low income rural and English language learning students and to kind of bring as a legislature bring everyone together on you know in my mind this should be everybody's cause regardless of their if their district has historically been overweighted or underweighted everybody should be taking up this cause because it's constitutional to have educational equity and it's also just the right thing to do and kind of the analogy I've given people is you know when we talked about vaccinating BIPOC Vermonters we as legislators didn't and shouldn't have said you know will this on average get my people in my community vaccinated sooner or later we said this is the right thing to do it's the equitable thing to do so we're going to do it so I've been working really hard on on messaging um, in the legislature on that and and hoping we'll make some progress this year um, and then I'll speak more briefly. The second is in my committee, Energy and Technology. I've been doing work organizing testimony around artificial intelligence, where Vermont is really um, the leader in this, one of, one of two or three states who are actually pushing out legislation looking at what is state government's role in, in the future of artificial intelligence, um, also an issue that intersects with racial and gender equity. Um, and then the, the third issue I've been working on is broadband expansion. And I'm sorry that I'm happy if anyone has questions and then I'm gonna have to hop off. So I'm sorry to run a little. Yeah, no problem, Lucy. Those are really two really fascinating issues. And I, I yeah, they actually are, there are plenty of intersections between the two. So really fascinating. I do have a question, but anyone else wanna go first? All right. Well, I would I would love to hear Lucy just yeah, kind of what you spoke to at the end of, of your uh, part about educational funding, kind of the um, how basically how you see folks re reacting to this idea, given that they're you know in, in any kind of uh, uh, funding model, there are going to be winners and losers, and certainly we all want to see equity and and especially funding directed to folks that need it most. But um, uh, but by definition, changing a formula is going to result in winners and losers. And so I'd love to hear you speak to how folks have been reacting to that. Yeah, I think I think the the issue is that when people are looking at it as winners and losers, there's kind of this creation of this, you know, is my community a winning community or a losing community? I actually don't think that's remotely accurate as a way to look at it because the reality is right now we have winners and losers in an inequitable system. What we're asking is to bring the system into equity, which is not creating new winners and losers, it's creating an equitable system and you don't have winners or losers in an equitable system. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, I, th I think you're right that that's kind of the perception and that's why it's a challenging bill, but I, I don't think it's accurate. I think, you know, right now we have winners and losers and, and, and I think this is kind of a broader issue in equity work is, uh, you know, the, the RBG quote is to those accustomed to privilege equality feels like oppression, right? So it's not, it's not creating a new system of winners and losers. It's 
getting rid of our present system of winners and losers and recognizing that that will be painful for some communities. It will be, and it's still the right thing to do. Great, thanks Lucy. Uh, Charlotte or Tom? Um, Lucy, can you talk about any efforts to uh, address equity in broadband coverage? Yeah, so I, I am assuming, are you referring to affordability or am I misinterpreting? Um, well, that, that's part of it. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be expensive to reach some really rural folks. Um, but there are certainly lots of other factors in people's access to broadband. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess the reason I hesitated is there's just there's a I could talk for you know thirty minutes. So trying to zero in on 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 the piece that you were talking about, but I, I guess I can say a couple things on that. Um, one is so the majority of under of towns that have unserved and underserved addresses belong to communication union districts in vermont and which uh shout out to scott as one of our newer members on our lamoille communication union district board um, i'm also a member of the board and and the communication union districts have missions that involve serving every address in their member towns so so in, on the house side, we've been advocating for um, kind of not necessarily that the communication union districts build the whole network, but funneling money through them. So the communication union districts have kind of local public, publicly accountable on the ground knowledge to say, we agree in funding this project because it's building out in a way that's part of a plan to reach every address. Whereas projects that are kind of willy nilly down the main road, actually take you further away from the ultimate goal of serving everybody because they undermine the business case for going back and serving the back roads. So that's that's one piece, just the basic, you know, how are we building in an intelligent way that brings us closer to serving everybody. Um, I think a second component of, of trying to have connectivity equity throughout the state that that's less talked about is the difference especially going into the future, the difference between having fiber optic versus DSL versus, you know, satellite. And, and right now there's kind of a low standard for what's considered broadband, but in the 10 or 20 years in the future, you know, most likely what's some part, some of what's considered broadband today will still be workable. And some of what's considered broadband today will no longer be relevant based on the changes in our world. And so, you know, my committee and I have been an advocate for just getting everybody that low threshold is, it might be equity now, but it's setting us up for inequity 10 or 20 years from now. So that's not an intelligent way to be investing in the future. And we need to be thinking about the kind of, in the, in the business, in the field, the word is future proof technology. Um, and then I think the final component is the affordability piece. And that piece is a little harder to work on right now where there's so many people who just don't have access. Like I feel, I think how we're gonna try to put a few affordability pieces in, but right now there's a lot of federal funding dealing with that. So we're focusing less on a state level and also kind of thinking about trying to get <laughs> the access out to people and then and then after uh, we've built a little uh, bit more looking at what what we can do to make sure that affordability isn't a barrier as well thank you very much i will say i've been thinking a lot about kind of i've been thinking a lot about broadband and more like social equity um pieces and and not not really I guess I, if anyone has thoughts they want to share with me now or later about how those may interact, I would be interested to, to hear them because I would imagine they do because I think everything does interact in that way. And I, I've been thinking about it and not coming up with like a strong sense, so. Great, thank you, Lucy. Really appreciate that thorough update. And um, uh, yeah, just really grateful, thank you. Um, See you, Lucy. 
Uh, well, we've got two more legislators. I know we, so we are going to go a little bit past past the hour. Uh, no pressure if folks have to have to leave, but I do just want to flag that we're going to be introducing everybody to Claire Cummings, who's the new executive director of BDP. So really excited for everyone to meet her if you're able to stay. Um, so I will turn it over next to, to Rep Representative Avram Pat, uh, if he's open to giving a, an overview of what he's been working on and, and really grateful to, for you to, to you for being here with us. Uh, thank you. Good evening. I just uh, joined the meeting a few minutes ago. I missed the, the, the discussion earlier because I was uh, otherwise engaged. Um, so uh, a couple of things. I serve on the same committee as Lucy Rogers, the Energy and Technology Committee. Um, uh, the thing I wanted to add around, around broadband is a couple of things. One, uh, we, our committee voted out and the, and the House with a very strong majority uh, approved the bill that went over to the Senate earlier this session. Um, the Senate is making some significant changes. Um, uh, they have some different approaches and things, and there are going to be issues that need to be worked out. I think the good news uh, is that pretty much everyone in the House and Senate, uh, where wherever they live in Vermont, whether they live in, in an underserved or unserved community, or they live in the middle of downtown Burlington, everybody understands the importance of this issue from, from every aspect. The, every, every kind of equity um, is, is involved in this, um, and, it, and, it, and it really is critical. And I agree, our committee has been focused on fiber because that, as Lucy just said, is, um, I'm not gonna say it's future proof, but it's future proof a fair way into the future. Um, if, we, if we get fiber to the last mile in rural Vermont, uh, that level of service is gonna last uh, a long time. If we get everybody uh, the kind of speeds that are available through Comcast or Starlink satellite, that may be better than what people have now, but it is, it is really seriously not uh, good enough. So there, there's going to be some more work um, uh, in the legislature to iron out these differences and approaches, funding issues that came up. You know, we we were in a hurry to get our bill out just as as the ARPA funds uh, uh, were becoming uh, available specifically for infrastructure like broadband. Um, so there'll there'll be I, I predict there'll be a fair amount of work that needs to be done between the House and the Senate. But again. Um, I, the, the, the universal agreement that we have to do something is a, is a real imperative that I think is motivating people. Um, so I, I want to say something about a bill that uh, passed last year, which, which came out of uh, our committee, which is the Global Warming Solutions Act. And you may recall that while it passed by a strong majority in the House and Senate, there was, I'm going to, I'm going to be kind and say there was a fair amount of ambivalence of, uh, uh, on the governor's part uh, and on members of administ the administration, at least when they were in our committee. The good news is um, that the, uh, the, the council and all of the, the structures we set up are, are not only working, uh, but people are damn serious about it, including secretaries and commissioners in the administration. Um, and they're doing, from, from my point of view, when we had reports on this, both written and, and testimony, from my point of view, this is what we wanted to have happen. And they are doing it and they're in, 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 in some ways doing more than we asked them to do to get, to get this off the ground. Um, and, and I'm very pleased with that. So that is a, a, a report on legislation from last year, but the legislation it, uh, at least for starters, set up this um, ongoing structure, at least for the next several years, um, to make very, very detailed proposals. The amount of involvement, uh, the, 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 the council themselves um, expanded themselves in terms of when they were picking subcommittees, there's a significant amount of people beyond the, the people that are um, required to be on the council um, by the statute, by the law that we passed, there, there's a significant amount of uh, people that have been involved in the various subcommittees that are working on it. And I'm just, uh, that, that may sound like a whole lot of bureaucratic stuff, but that, that is what we wanted to have happen. We need, we need concrete 
proposals to come from this group for regulations, uh, statute that the legislature needs to do and things like that. So we can uh, um, seriously do uh, our small part as a small state um, in reducing uh, climate change globally. That's my report. Great, thank you, Avram. Yeah, really helpful to, to know about the Global Warming Solutions Act and its implementation. It's always good to hear that you're following up on things that you've already done and, and, and making sure that they're implemented as expected. Any, any questions? All right, well, Dave, uh, you are last to go uh, with a last name of, of Yakovoni. You're always going to be the last. I apologize. We'll yeah, go I grew by up last with name. That. Used to it, yeah. Always yeah. at the end of the line. I'll be I'll I'll be brutally brief so that folks can hear from Claire, which is probably more important than what I have to say. Do no harm. Do no harm is what Saudi has said. I hope I can uh, meet that goal. One of the challenges I'm trying to grapple with uh, this week. Um, I'll share with you. Imagine you and your partner work hard and you're able to come up with enough money and you, you buy a duplex and you rent it out. And um, your, your, I hate to use the word, landlords, your property owners. And all of a sudden, um, the person you rent it out to doesn't pay the rent. Not for one month, not for two months, not for four months, but eight months, they haven't paid the rent. And there's a pandemic that hits and the law prohibits you from evicting that person. And you don't know what to do. You're calling your banker and your banker's not really that sympathetic and you don't have the extra money to meet those obligations. You go to the tenant and you say, there's a, there's a rental assistance program Will you apply. And the person says, I don't wanna be bothered. You can't evict me. This is happening over Vermont um, um, anecdotally, I hear this from people and they tell the commissioner of housing, I'm never going to rent again when I get out of this, which means what available housing is available after the pandemic, the cost is going to go up. People are going to uh, charge more and make it harder to get housing. So what do I do as a legislator? There's not a whole lot we can do. Vermont could amend its state law to parallel the federal law, which says if a tenant does not apply for and seek assistance, they could be evicted. So to be clear, you're still protected during a pandemic. You can't be evicted if you apply for help. But if you don't, you could be evicted. Whole nother story, which I won't get into, uh, there's a backlog in the courts, so it could be many months before that eviction happened, and you might lose your uh, du duplex. But these are the challenges we face, and there might be children involved, and we want to protect children, um, folks dealing with poverty in many different ways. These are the challenges, but I'm reminded, do no harm. So we'll try to sort through the, the uh, doctrine of fairness and figure out the right thing to do. We'll be grappling with that, I think, in the next uh, week or so in the legislature in some form. Thanks for listening. Sorry to be so brief, but I'm respectful that it's been a long day and you've all been here for a while already. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And housing is certainly an area that has so many difficult trade-offs, so I really appreciate you sharing that and giving us an inside view. Um, Dan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that I think I've heard from somebody in every one of my towns that is dealing with this. So uh, it's definitely an issue that we're going to have to come up with a solution for. Um, or, yeah, we're not going to have the housing stock that we used to have when this is over. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. All right. Any remaining questions before we proceed into the, the end of our meeting? All right, well, we're gonna head into uh, the, the post broadcasted part of our session now um, to discuss a few logistical issues, but I'm um, uh, really grateful to everyone for, for attending this broadcasted part of our meeting. Uh, thank you so much for, for attending and we'll send out on Front Porch Forum uh, the announcement for next month's meeting. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your week.